Good evening, and welcome to the second night of this year's Bohr Symposium. I'm Dana Cotton, a doctoral student in the College of Education and a member of the Bohr Committee. We would like to thank you very much for coming tonight and take this opportunity to remind you that tomorrow night is going to be the last event of this year's symposium featuring Jared Diamond at 7 o'clock. I would also like to take this time to remind you to turn off your cell phones. Thanks. And now it is my great privilege to introduce tonight's speaker. Severn Kola Suzuki, born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, has been active in environmental and social justice work since kindergarten. At age nine, she helped to form the Environmental Children's Organization, a small group of children committed to learning and teaching other kids about environmental issues. Among other early successes, Severn appeared at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit and delivered a powerful speech, reminding the decision makers who the conference's outcomes would ultimately affect. The following year, she received the UN Environment Program's Global 500 Award at a ceremony in Beijing, China. Later, as a member of UN Secretary General Kofi Annan's Special Advisory Panel, she and members of the group brought their first project, a pledge called the Recognition of Responsibility, to the UN World Summit in Johannesburg in August 2002. An accomplished television host and presenter, Severn has appeared and participated in many programs in Canada, the US, the US, and Britain, and continues to speak to schools and corporations and at many conferences and international meetings, often speaking on the necessity of divining our values, acting with the future in mind, and on individual responsibility. She is currently the director of the Skyfish Project, an internet-based think tank for those concerned about environmental and social issues. She graduated from Yale in 2002 with a degree in biology and is currently attending the University of Victoria, working on a master's degree in ethnoecology, researching the Kwakwakiwak First Nation. One of the reasons I am so grateful to be introducing Severn tonight is not only that she is a student, just like many of us, but that we share a common passion and goal. Education is a powerful tool for change, and she expresses that passion in many ways, including encouraging young people to speak out for their future. Please join me in welcoming Severn Kola Suzuki. Thank you, Dana. Wow, what an introduction. Hopefully I have some material left. <laughs> I'm very, very honored to be speaking to you all uh, this evening. I'm, I'm very honored to be here at the University of Idaho here in Moscow. I've never been here before, so it's very exciting for me. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Coeur d'Alene and also the Nez Perce. Um, it's important to acknowledge the first people on whose territory we now, we now share. In the context of the symposium, I am sandwiched between last night's politics of resource scarcity and tomorrow's potential social collapse. Talk about being stuck between a rock and a hard place. And tonight, I want to connect you, yourselves, and myself into this discussion. And indeed, we are the cru crucial ingredient in this sandwich. I believe that it is what individuals decide our responsibility is that will determine how we deal with scarcity and collapse in the modern world. It's a great honor for me to be speaking here at the same symposium as Michael Clare, Aaron Wolf, and Jared Diamond. These lecturers are great academics. They're people who are pursuing truth and knowledge. But the reason that they stand out is because of their dedication to the idea that we have a responsibility to contribute to the positive direction of the way that we are going. And they're part of a movement of academics who can no longer remain impartial, who can no longer remain detached. 
In order to find the solutions to our global eco-social crises, scientists and researchers can no longer proceed without becoming activist, emotional, involved, and connected to the subjects that they study. And I think that these lecturers are part of a movement of these academics who can no longer stand by and they are calling to the rest of us to become informed and to act. And I really want to commend them. I've noticed that this is a trend not only in this symposium, but beyond. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at the Pacific Estuary Research Society conference in the San Juan Islands. And I was blown away by the activist tone of the ecologists that were participating in this academic conference. I had, had no idea. The keynote lecturers were classic um, marine biologists. One was a kelp scientist. And the two lecturers, the subjects were, uh, the first was ecological demise and our human responsibility. It was really a philosophical lecture. And the second was towards a sea ethic, very much along the same vein, really talking about how to engage the public about these, these problems that are affecting um, these scientists' areas of research. And I realized that these ecologists are being forced to get involved because their field of study, the very things that they are basing their academic lives and careers on, are becoming endangered. The same weekend, there was uh, an article in the Globe and Mail. This is our national newspaper. Um, this is from February 18th, 2006. It quoted the eminent fish biologist, Daniel Pauly. He's at the University of British Columbia. And I quote, we don't need more science, Dr. Pauly said in a statement released yesterday as he prepared to make a presentation to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Of course, we, le we need to learn more about fish. But research is often publicly funded on the grounds that this is an alternative to other political action. We know enough now to prevent the continued decimation of global fisheries. That's not exactly a statement you'd expect from a scientist. But there are so many examples of this. And perhaps most notably is an organization called the Union of Concerned Scientists. And in 1992, this, this group of of scientists released a very stark warning to humanity. And the statement was signed by over 1,700 scientists, including the majority of the world's living Nobel Prize laureates in the in areas of science. And I'll just read a little bit to you because the language is just so far from what you normally read in your, in your normal academic papers or journals. Introduction. Human beings in the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage on our environment and on critical resources. If not checked, many of our current practices put at serious risk the future that we wish for human society and the plant and animal kingdoms and may so alter, living, uh, may so alter the living world that it will be unable for, to sustain life in the manner that we know. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the collision our present course will bring about. Later on, it goes to warn us, warning, we, the undersigned, senior members of the world's scientific community, hereby warn all humanity of what lies ahead. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and on the, of the life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. Pretty intense stuff. <laughs> These passionate human beings are changing the nature of academia and science. And they're using the research that they're doing to shift our human course. Our scientists are telling us that we don't have the luxury of remaining objective and detached and uninvolved. So tonight, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about myself, about three main themes of my education, about science, local and traditional ecological knowledge, and three the nerve to speak out. And then I'm going to tell you a story 
um, which kind of ties in all these threads. And finally, this piece will tie into the topic of my, of my speech tonight, which is a discussion of our personal responsibility in the face of all this, uh, of all these challenges. I'm 26 years old. I've been trying to affect social change in the area of what they call environmental issues since I was very small. And first, I, I just want to start off by talking about this word, the environment. The environment. Now imagine you're engaged in your very busy day. Uh, maybe you're in the car and the, the radio comes on and you hear them talking about blah, 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 the environment, blah, blah, blah. Now without thinking about this very much, remember you're distracted, you're not really paying attention. I want you to just think about what do you, what do you think about? What, what, what words does this, um, what does the environment conjure in your head? I can still see you, so put up your hand and shout it out. Trees. Trees. Oxygen. Oxygen. Gardens. 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 Ecosystems. Ecosystems. Wilderness. Wilderness. Animals. Animals, nature. Hibernation. Water. Water. Life. Life. Immediate surroundings. Immediate surroundings, yes. Well, I still think that when most people think about the environment, they don't think about their immediate surroundings. I think a lot of people, yeah, they think about, um, I mean, I do too, because this, this word environment is often used in tandem with things like, uh, yeah, wilderness or recycling or um, the Kyoto Protocol, things that are very um, detached from our day-to-day day -day, day -day living. We don't think about it as everything that surrounds us. We don't think of it as, uh, usually, as the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, our economic interactions. We don't think of it as our community that surrounds us. We don't think of it as our, the waste that we throw away. In fact, you're absolutely right, the environment is simply the matrix. We are all human animals in this room. We are all acutely dependent on the air that we all are now sharing. We are all acutely dependent on the food that we ate today that came from all over the world. And so we all have to be very preoccupied with our environment. And I'm realizing as I'm getting deeper into um, my studies of indigenous ecology that the very concept of the environment, or ecology, or even nature. Our, our concept of these things really shows the biggest difference between our Western scientific idea of the, of the world and indigenous understanding of what humans and the world are to each other. And in many cultures, there is no word for environment. The very separation of our environment as an idea, as a concept, inherently teaches us that, yeah, it's a separate thing. It's an external thing, an abstracted concept. Dave Foreman, who is the founder of Earth First, says, I hate the word the environment. You can love a forest, you can love a mountain, you can love a plant, but how can you love an abstract concept like the environment? The environmental movement should have called itself the human health movement because that's basically what it cares about, the impact of pollution, urbanization, and everything else on human health. I bring this up because the language and the framing of this issue of the environment in our society, I think, really is an indication of the way that our culture has really separated and fragmented our understanding of cause and effect, and so relinquishes us from any accountability and any responsibility to the repercussions of our day-to-day -day actions that absolutely have effects on our environment. Of course they do. And this fragmentation is causing major problems, and I think that it's a source of a lot of the pollution that we uh, of a lot of environmental problems that we are experiencing today. And these challenges, this fragmentation, is in turn bringing us to a point of needing to reassess and synthesize and bring back all the connections together so that we can start understanding 
the strife in our societies and the, the problems with our environment. I know the reason that I'm so preoccupied with my environment, and that's definitely because of my education as a kid. Like all of you in this room, I'm a product of my childhood. I grew up in the city of Vancouver in British Columbia in Canada, and I spent a lot of time as a child down at the intertidal zone at low tide, mucking around in the tide pools. And I've heard many scientists, many biologists talk about uh, their childhoods in the swamps or in the ditches and creeks, falling in love with biology. And definitely, I know that, uh, that the tide pools led to a formal education in objective classical biological studies for myself. But looking back, I also see that I had a parallel stream of education rooted in what I'm learning in school, they call, now I'm learning in school, um, we can call local and traditional ecological knowledge. And food was my major in these studies. In what could be called local ecological knowledge, and this is what locals know but the scientists don't, I've learned how to grow and catch food right in my own city of Vancouver. Where I grew up in Vancouver, in our, in, our, in our house, my grandma and granddad lived with us, my mother's parents. And from the beginning, we ate local. My granddad keeps a, a big, beautiful garden, and we grew up eating the vegetables, the um, salad, the fruit that granddad grew for us. And uh, right now, it's the month of March, and we just finished planting the garden, um, part of it, for, for, the, for the springtime. My family has always fished for food, and every, every summer we go down to the seawall, which is near our house as well, and uh, at the high tide in the, right time, in the right season, we fish for smelts. And uh, no matter what time of night the high tide is, we'll throw our nets and hope for a big run, and then when we, um, when we go back home, we'll fry up a big, a big feast no matter what time of night it is. It's really fun. And there's all kinds of little nuances that I, just in going through this exercise of thinking, hmm, what is my local ecological knowledge? There's all kinds of things that I know how to do that I wouldn't even really have thought of if I wasn't really thinking about it. And there are things like, well, knowing what, what, uh, what tide to go out, um, when to go out so that I'll get a good spot on the seawall, or when to choose when to fish on the seawall and not fish on, on a nearby beach instead, and what to look for when I'm setting my net. These little things that you don't, really, uh, you don't really learn unless you spend the time and unless you were taught by someone else who knows what they're doing. Traditional ecological knowledge. Um, this is differentiated. Uh, I'm learning all this academic kind of lingo for these things that I've always done. Traditional ecological knowledge. Um, this, is, this is slightly different. Growing up, my, my whole family we would fish in Vancouver, sure, but we would also travel all, all over the province, camping and fishing, especially in the, in the summertime. And we spend a lot of time in First Nations villages, our uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian native people, we call them our First Nations. And we spend a lot of time in First Nations villages, especially in Haida Gwaii, uh, the Queen Charlotte Islands, a little archipelago off the west coast, uh, in Bella Bella or Alert Bay, and in Haida Gwaii, we're always going up for someone's potlatch or someone's feast. And when we go up for a feast, you, come, you, you go to these, these amazing meals, and they're usually held in the community hall, and all of the food has been caught off the islands. And it's all been caught by someone's, the person who's giving the potlatch or the feast by their family or by the appropriate clan according, according to different protocols. And then the food's all being prepared by that family and prepared specifically by the clan for these certain purposes and all having to do with the ceremonial acts of the, of the feast. And feasts are where people are given names, where people are given songs, where people are honored, um, memorials, weddings. It's all around food. And I've heard in Haida Gwaii the saying, our food is our medicine. After I graduated from high school, I spent time with a Haida woman, Diane Brown, who took me out onto the reefs and the ocean, and she showed me how to, how to catch 
catch that food. She told me, she taught me that when the tide is out, the table is set. And she's shown me how to spear sea urchins, how to collect rock scallops, how to catch salmon and halibut and cod, and how to give thanks for the food that we catch. At the same time as having all these wonderful experiences, I was also seeing some major problems. At home in Vancouver, we would also fish with hand lines for flounders. And uh, we started catching flounders full of tumors from pollution. Um, smelts are a bit different because they came out from the open waters and they come in to spawn. But the flounders, um, they are obviously just living off the, uh, what the city puts out. So we stopped catching them. And in the province, driving up any of our highways, you can see you know, these huge clear cuts and all the landslides that are caused by them. And in the small communities up north, our friends were definitely feeling the effects of failing resource-based industries. Unemployment is a huge problem. Depression is a huge problem. Suicide is a huge problem. And it really seems, seemed that the technology of logging, the science of fishing, were overexploiting the industry's capital. There was a, a third avenue of my, edu my education growing up. I learned that if you do care about something, then you have to raise your voice. One thing I've always been taught is that you have to stand up for what you believe. My Japanese-Canadian father was a victim of prejudice during the Second World War. He was only a child, about eight years old, and a third-generation Canadian, so he didn't even speak Japanese. And yet him and his family were interned um, by the Canadian government and sent to live in the, in, the, in the mountains for three years. And even after the war, even after the threat was gone, um, the Canadian government said to its Japanese Canadians that they had two choices. They could either take a one-way ticket back to Japan, which was a foreign country, or they could move east of the Rockies. And yeah, Japan was a foreign country, so of course they moved east, they went to Ontario and started a new life. So of course he was completely affected, affected by this and all his life he has, he, has, he has stood up against prejudice and social injustice. On the other side of my family, my English grandparents, well they actually fought during the Second World War. And they have been such advocates for peace ever since, and especially against racism. I've never heard anyone, uh, I've never heard of anyone else in my family who's kicked anyone else, anyone out of the house for uh, a, a slightly racist comment, but my, my grandmother definitely has. And she actually saw Hitler speaking to his soldiers in a square in Germany. So all my life she has taught me that you have to stand up against what you know is wrong. From First Nations friends, I grew up hearing the stories of our residential schools. I think there were similar schools here in the States. Uh, there were efforts by the Canadian government to eradicate Indigenous culture. And from them, I've learned the social, the emotional, um, the cultural implications of what that does to a people. This experience shows the severe personal and societal consequences of prejudice and racism. And we have to speak up about this in order to be able to begin to heal these rifts and prevent prejudice from happening again. So these three avenues are the backdrop for what is really important to me today and really constitutes what, well, it's the backdrop for what I think that my personal responsibility is. I want to tell you a story because it links up my educations of science, traditional ways of living, and the necessity of speaking out. And this story kind of starts when I was eight years old. Um, when I was about eight, my little sister was five. My parents became very involved in an issue that was happening very far away. 
my father uh, was involved. He, he was a broadcaster in, in Canada, and he was very involved um, in traveling and, and, and researching different things. And he had met this amazing guy called Payakan, who lived in Brazil. He was a Kayapo Indian. And Payakan was an amazing guy. He had grown up in the rainforest. He had grown up living a, a traditional life. And for some reason, he decided, because he, he knew that there was an outside world, he decided that he wanted to go into the city and learn what was happening in the outside world. And so he went into the city and he learned how to speak uh, the country's language, Portuguese. And he learned about these plans that were being made for his territory. And they were plans to make a hydroelectric dam. And the problem with these dams was that it would flood out not only thousands of hectares of rainforests, birds and animals, but dozens of indigenous villages. And many of the people who lived in this area didn't even know that these plans were being made. And so Payakan was working to organize a big meeting of all of these different tribes to come together to protest the building of these dams. And I remember, I remember hearing a phone call. My dad hadn't been home for weeks. And I remember when he called home and he told my mom on the phone about this amazing person he'd met and how they had to get involved in what was happening. In the end, the coalition of indigenous people actually won. The World Bank withdrew its funding, and these dams have not been built yet. This victory was incredible. I mean, for uh, a person from the rainforest to, to organize this, was, this was definitely a coup. It led to inevitable death threats, and uh, the activist, the rubber tapper, Chico Mendez, had just been murdered, so it was quite a serious thing. And Payakan knew that he had to leave the area. He had to take his family and just kind of chill out for a little while. And he knew my parents in Canada. And so he decided to bring his family to Canada to, uh, to lie low for a while. So when I, was, when I was eight years old, this indigenous Kayapo family came to stay with us in the city of Vancouver. And they stayed in our basement for six weeks. <laughs> and it was just amazing. Um, they were totally from a different a different world. There was Payakan, there was his wife Irakran, she was only about 22, very, very fierce. Um, there was three daughters, Oe, Tanya, and Mayal, who were one, four, and five. And they'd never seen the ocean before, they'd never um, seen snow before. I'm, I'm not sure whether they had been to, this, to a city before. And here they were staying with us. And I remember the first time that, um, or the first day that they were, they had just arrived, my mom went downstairs to check on them. And she found the two little girls. They had made a fire in the fireplace. And then they'd pulled the coals out onto the hardwood floor, just playing with the fire. Because where they live, it's a, it's a mud floor, so it doesn't matter. You can just have a fire wherever. Um, they, uh, they, loved, they loved snow, they loved the ocean, they loved the whales at the aquarium. We went back to the aquarium about 13 times in six weeks. Um, they just, you know, every, everything they were seeing was so amazing for them. And it was incredible to see the world through their eyes. We became great friends with them. Um, my little sister, even ended up bringing uh, Oe and Tanya to school with her for show and tell. <laughs> and as well, during that time, um, my mom, my dad, my sister and I traveled all over British Columbia uh, with the Kayapo chief uh, and his family, setting up meetings of cultural exchange with the people of our longhouses, of our traditional houses in our, in our province. And it was really incredible to see that even though these people are, you know, they're, they're so far, far from each other, they're so different, and culturally they're just at very different levels. And yet there was such a sense of solidarity, there was such an understanding. When they finally left, um, yeah, it was six weeks, the family, it was, it was, so, it was very sad, um, and the family wanted to return the favor to us, and so they invited us 
They said, come, we've stayed with you. Now you must come and stay with us in our home. And so the following year, we took them up on this offer. And the following year, my mom, my dad, my sister and I, we traveled down to Brazil. We traveled down to um, southern Pará. We traveled down to the Xingu Valley and finally to the tiny village of Aokri. And sometimes you can point to defining moments in your life, times that really change what happens next. And because of this trip when I was nine, I really began to take a different kind of responsibility and really become involved. So I was supposed to have beautiful slides to show you this evening of that wonderful trip, but um, my four o'clock in the morning departure this morning, um, I think was, a, was why I forgot the slides at home. Um, so unfortunately, I'll just tell you the story. And I do have a, a video to show you right in the middle, so um, you will get a little break. We went down to the forest, and basically, uh, we lived as people have lived for thousands of years. We, we landed on a tiny little airstrip. The only way that you can get into the village of Aokri is if you fly um, There's a, in a tiny, tiny little plane. I mean like a, like a four-person plane. Um, and it's crammed full of goods to bring into the village. Or you can paddle for eight days from the nearest city. So it's, 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 it's out there. And when we arrived, our plane came in and we were immediately surrounded by all these people who were just wearing paint. It was totally like we were landing on another planet. And this is where we stayed for two weeks in the, this little village, about 200 people. We spent most of our time in the river. It's where we, uh, where we relaxed, where it was nice and cool, and it's where we, we played, and it's also where, while we were swimming, women were fishing and catching piranhas. <laughs> that took a little bit of time to get over. But it was just an amazing time. We, um, we spent a lot of time fishing, of course, which kept us very happy, but they also, life completely revolves around the river, and we would go on these trips up the river, catching different kinds of fish, all kinds of different ways of catching the fish from nets that were cast out and, and splayed out in a circular kind of fashion to catch a whole school to um, floats that were set with little floating pieces of wood and then uh, a line and then a, a piece of meat on the end that we would leave for hours and then come back and find because they were swimming all over the river um, to electric eels that were speared with arrows to tukunare, which were speared, uh, which were shot with the arrows, and they were an incredible, incredibly, um, uh, they, were, they were fish that just fought so hard. It was just very exciting to catch a, a tukunare. We would, uh, we would also get turtle eggs from the shore banks. It was, it was an amazing way to live, and, and I was, was really blown away to experience that. And maybe the most important thing that I learned was that when you're living off the land in that way, there's no separation between yourself and your environment. I mean, you really are part of the food chain, and it's really, it's really quite obvious. We finally had to leave after two incredible weeks, and uh, so we got back into the little plane, and we flew back into the, into the air. And this time, flying back over the rainforest, we saw that actually the forest below us was on fire. And the sky was full of smoke. It was so smoky that we could stare straight at the sun. And the smoke crept in our plane. And, and it, it was really, really scary. I, I, I didn't know what was going on. Now, of course, this was the famous burning of the Amazon rainforest. I didn't really know anything about it um, that this land was being burned for cattle ranching, mostly uh, a cause, uh, because of the intense poverty of many of the people of Brazil. And uh, this, this land that's cleared, it can only really sustain cattle for about a year because the soil is so thin. And so then more land has to be burned. And so it's an incredibly unsustainable practice. It's not a solution. And this experience 
just completely <laughs> blew my mind. I didn't know why. I didn't know what was happening. I just knew that this was wrong, and I had to do something about it. So when I got back to Canada, I, uh, I got back to grade five and to my friends, and I told them what I'd seen. And they'd also heard about the environment. This was during the 80s, so the environment was a hot issue. And, uh, and then we learned about what was happening in the Amazon. And we decided to form a club. We decided to start educating ourselves about environmental problems. And so we formed ECHO, the Environmental Children's Organization. And that's how we started. We started just asking anybody who would give us any information, teachers, parents, you know, what, what are problems with the environment? What's happening? What can we do? We started doing lots of little projects, beach cleanups, little fundraisers for local projects that were happening. Uh, we published a series of newsletters for other kids our age with the information we were learning. Um, we did this with the help of a local youth organization. We fundraised to buy a water filter for the Penan people who were on tour. They were talking about their, their, their problems in Malaysia. And after a few years of this, it was, it was really fun. I mean, it was a club after school. Um, after a few years of this, I heard about a big meeting that was going to be held in, in Brazil again. Um, this big meeting was going to be held by the United Nations, and they were going to bring together the largest gathering of heads of state ever held. And they were going to come together to discuss issues of environment and development. And apparently this conference was really going to set the tone for sustainable development in the 21st century. It was going to really you know, change the direction of our lives. And so we thought, wow, there's going to be all of these old men coming together and they're going to make all these decisions that are going to completely affect our lives. Someone should go to represent the people who are actually going to be affected by these decisions. So we should go. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine what my parents said when I told them this. They said, you are crazy. There's going to be 30,000 people there. You know, I mean, security. It's just going to be a madhouse. You guys are 12, 11 years old. You know, this is going to be nuts. And yet we couldn't let this go. We kept on talking about this idea to, again, teachers, friends, parents, friends, uh, parents. And lo and behold, people liked this idea. And people started making little donations to our project. Well, as soon as we started getting money, we thought, oh my gosh, this could, what? This is, this is real. Wow. And so, uh, with the help of, again, this uh, local youth organization, the Environmental Youth Alliance, um, we held a fundraiser. They coached us. They showed us how to um, hold a fundraiser, how to make a pitch for money, how to give a speech. And from our community, we were able to raise enough money to send four of us to go to Rio. It was amazing. So then um, my parents decided, well, we couldn't go on our own. So uh, they decided to, my parents came and they chaperoned. Uh, another parent came as well. Um, and we, we didn't know what to do, but we had registered as an NGO group. There was so many different organizations, non-governmental organizations that were attending this conference, thousands and thousands of people there. And we'd registered it as an as a official organization. We had a little booth. We had a venue to give out um, pamphlets, which we'd photocopied and, and stuck together, about why we were there and what we wanted to say. Because we were so unusual, because we were you know, the only kids in a sea of, ad of adults, we started getting attention. People wanted to know why we were there. And so we, we began to get venues to speak. People started inviting us to speak for, you know, three minutes here, five minutes there, and start getting our message out, which was basically to remember why these people were there, to ask all the delegates to first consider their roles as parents, and it's people who are protecting the futures of their own children when they were making their decisions. On the last day that we were there, we were there for two weeks, and we worked really hard. On the last day that we were there, we were about to leave. We packed up all our stuff, and we were, out, we were about to get out the door to catch our plane. We got a call from the UN. 
and someone had dropped out of a plenary session. The plenary is where the official, where all the, the politicians come together every day. And someone had dropped out of the session and they had a little window and if we wanted to get there in an hour, we could speak for five minutes. So of course we forgot about our airplane, we dropped all our stuff, we jumped in a crazy Brazilian taxi and we, we, we started weaving in throughout all these cars and it was all hectic and in the back seat me and my friends are trying to figure out what the best thing would be to say to these world leaders. And, and we, we practiced quite a bit so we, we had a really good sense of what our message was. And we only had an hour to get there, rushed there, raced through security, ran up to the plenary session and gave a speech. And now I have a video of the speech. I don't normally show it because it's kind of funny. It's me and then it's me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll show it to you because my other slides didn't work. And if Mary can make it work, that would be awesome. Hello, I'm Severin Suzuki speaking for ECHO, the Environmental Children's Organization. We're a group of 12 and 13 year olds trying to make a difference. Vanessa Setti, Morgan Geisler, Michelle Quigg, and me. We've raised all the money to come here ourselves, to come 5,000 miles to tell you adults you must change your ways. Coming up here today, I have no hidden agenda. I am fighting for my future. Losing my future is not like losing an election or a few points on the stock market. I am here to speak for all generations to come. I am here to spe speak on behalf of the starving children around the world whose cries go unheard. I am here to speak for the countless animals dying across this planet because they have nowhere left to go. I am afraid to go out in the sun now because of the holes in our ozone. I am afraid to breathe the air because I don't know what chemicals are in it. I used, to go in, I used to go fishing in Vancouver, my home, with my dad until just a few years ago we found the fish full of cancers. And now we hear of animals and plants going extinct every day vanishing forever. In my life, I have dreamt of seeing the great herds of wild animals, jungles and rainforests full of birds and butterflies, but now I wonder if they will even exist for my children to see. Did you have to worry of these things when you were my age? All this is happening before our eyes and yet we act as if we have all the time we want and all the solutions. I'm only a child and I don't have all the solutions, but I, know, I want you to realize neither do you. You don't know how to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up in a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please, Stop breaking it. Here, you may be delegates of your government, business people, organizers, reporters, or politicians, but really, your mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, aunts and uncles, and all of you are someone's child. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all part of a family. Five billion strong, in fact, 30 million species strong, and borders and governments will never change that. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all in this together and should act as one single world towards one single goal. In, in my anger, I am not blind, and in my fear, I am not afraid of telling the world how I feel. In my country, we make so much waste. We buy and throw away, buy and throw away, buy and throw away, and yet northern countries will not share with the needy. Even when we have more than enough, we are afraid to share. We are afraid to let go of some of our wealth. In Canada, we live the privileged life with plenty of food, water, and shelter. 
We have watches, bicycles, computers, and television sets. The list could go on for two days. Two days ago here in Brazil, we were shocked when we spent time with some children living on the streets. This is what one child told us. I wish I was rich. And if I were, I would give all the street children food, clothes, medicines, shelter, and love and affection. If a child on the streets who has nothing is willing to share, why are we who have everything? Well, it didn't quite have the effect that I wanted, but <laughs> at least it's an easier act to follow. Mm. So flash forward 14 years, and here we are. Um, the title of my talk this evening is Conflict and Cooperation, an Individual's Responsibility. And this discussion of responsibility emerges in the face of massive, the massive global problem of climate change. And it's funny looking back at that speech because in 1992, hardly anybody was talking about climate change. And now it really is uh, obviously a very, very big problem for the 21st century. It's being created by the imperceptible accumulation of the pollution of actions of the industrialized world whose lifestyles have depended on a very high consumption of, of fossil fuel. But today we really have to deal with consequences that affect our entire globe. We also have to deal with the fact that the rest of the world, which is going gangbusters, industrializing and developing and doing their best as per, per standard of the first world, is also increasing its pollution and impact on the planet towards our per capita levels. Can we tell them not to do what we have done and continue to do? I was at the conference of the parties in Montreal this past December. This was the first meeting of the Kyoto Protocol countries, the signatories, since it became international law in February last year. And the attitude at this conference was very different from the attitude at the Kyoto Protocol Conference itself in 1997. And I'm very I'm both very happy and also sad to report that there is no debate about whether or not climate change was happening. I mean, in 1997, still there was some of this dialogue and debate, but not this year, not last year in, in December. I'm happy because we have moved on beyond debating the science, and now we're getting on with doing something about it. But I'm sad because it's out of necessity and it's out of the reality and the severity of the situation that the international community is taking this issue so seriously. The Kyoto Conference happened in 1997, and that's when all the numbers were decided for the first part of the protocol. And it was then that it was decided that Canada, my country, would aim for carbon dioxide emissions of 6% below 1990 levels by the year 2010. But we didn't do anything about it. And so by the time it was, well, the Conference of the Parties in December, our numbers were that we have to reduce our emissions by 25%. By putting it off, we've made the challenge way harder. The more we put it off, the harder it would be become. By not addressing the challenge early, we make it harder and harder for the next generations to actually do something about it. What are our responsibilities towards those future generations. You always hear the question, what is Kyoto going to cost? But the real question is, what is the cost of not implementing Kyoto? The automotive industry is, of course, fighting government regulation tooth and nail. Of course, we can't forget that this same industry also fought seat belts and catalytic converters and airbags. The costs of not addressing the issue are staring us in the face. And one industry that's really advocating for us to take it seriously is the uh, insurance industry. 
And you just look at the at the weather patterns of this last year, and you can see why. In Canada, we had a crazy erratic winter weather. Just look at the hurricane season on the east coast of North America. Look at the droughts in East Africa, the melting permafrost in our Arctic in Canada, pine beetle infestations in my province in BC, rain, mudslides in the Philippines, all of the, the fire and brimstone that we saw in that movie, The, the Day After Tomorrow, that terrible movie. It was, it was pretty ridiculous, but for more than a handful of people on this planet, that day actually is today. And this issue of climate change is really a perfect example of how environmental issues really aren't isolated. They're not issues of trees and bees. They're not, they're not even just about loss of biodiversity. It's completely an issue of economics, and it's completely an issue about social justice. My friend Miali Kohli um, in Iqaluit in Nunavut tells me that the hunters, the Inuit hunters uh, in her community are having a really hard time hunting on the ice because the, the weather is so different that they can't read the ice anymore. And on top of that, the animals have sh are shifting their migration and it's just making it harder and harder and more, more dangerous to hunt. So climate change is already beginning to really affect people whose survival is already really on the edge. Climate change is an issue of health. Uh, the flip side of air pollution besides climate change is the effects on our respiratory systems. And Health Canada came out with a, a number last year, uh, a couple years ago, that 16,000 Canadians die every year because of air pollution. Asthma is a modern problem we've all come to accept as a fact of life. Every elementary school class has at least a couple kids with puffers. But this was a condition that was very rare 50 years ago. It's an issue of basic human rights. It's going to, it is already affecting the world's freshwater resources. And of course, Aaron Wolf, Aaron Wolf spoke last night about water and, co and conflict. Many people in the world do not have good access to fresh water. Um, my cousin is uh, in Ethiopia at the moment, and he he sent emails home, and that was the only way I knew anything about the droughts and the famine that's currently happening, happening in East Africa. Climate issues are and will result in millions of environmental refugees. What is our responsibility to other humans who have no access to water? And because it affects basic human needs, it is and it will become an issue of peace and security as obviously the speakers at this symposium have been talking about and will talk about tomorrow. Two Februarys ago, the Pentagon released, uh, uh, commissioned and released, uh, no, it didn't re release, but the Pentagon commissioned a report on climate change specifically for its implications for homeland security. This was commissioned by Andrew Marshall, a respected military strategist, and the findings stated that global warming may pose a bigger threat than terrorism because it will cause mass migration of environmental re refugees and destabilize societies as they compete over dwindling resources. The report concludes, disruption and conflict will be endemic features of life, and the report's authors say that climate change should be elevated beyond a scientific debate to a U.S. national security concern. Now, just out of curiosity, this was, I know it was two Februarys ago, but did anybody hear about this report? Raise your hand. Hmm, that's maybe five people. And that's not your fault. That's just because of, uh, uh, because of the media. Now, how are we directly implicated in this debate about global resources and scarcity? Each of us here is part of creating this conflict. Now, you need, one needs a roadmap or a way of thinking about issues such as climate change. Otherwise, you'll go nuts. I mean, it's just such a huge, a huge concept that you have to have some way of focusing in. So I've been just focusing on my own country, my own people, Canada, and yourselves, my neighbors, 
about our role in all of this. And in, in focusing, just to have some, some anchor, some way of addressing this, some way of researching this, I've realized that North Americans are incredibly important for the globe's transition to dealing with these things and towards sustainability. To illustrate uh, a tool that's good to, to use to actually think about how much we're consuming and what our impacts are. The ecological footprint. Now, have any of you heard of the ecological footprint? Put up your hand. Oh, awesome, that's great. That's excellent. Well, basically, um, it's, a, it's a measurement, it's a, a unit of measuring how much we consume and how much we waste. It measures how much biologically reproductive land an ocean each person or each country uses in order to provide, um, provide resources and um, absorb our wastes. And it's a way of standardizing and measuring our consumption. And according to uh, the Global Footprint Network, globally we're currently using land and oceans at a rate that it can't regenerate. So this is unsustainable and currently we have to really scale back our consumption and waste production. Distributed equally, each person would have 2.2 hectares of arable land. Currently, Americans consume 9.7 hectares per capita, and Canadians are right up there as well. In India, as just as a comparison, they consume 0.7 hectares, so that's nine hectares less. And if, in if Afghanistan, they consume 0.1 hectares. Canada and the US, which together are about 5% of the world's population, consumes more energy than India, the Middle East, South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Oceania combined, which is about 50% of the population. By the age of only six months, each Canadian has consumed as much resources as the average person in the developing world will in his or her lifetime. So sometimes when people hear me ranting on about all this stuff, they say, oh, you're one of those people that wants to change the world. Aww. <laughs> but as you can hear from those statistics, here in North America, we already are changing the world. But, but, we have the choice of how we change the world. We don't have to consume so much. We don't have to pollute the world so much. The solutions to our waste are out there, and unlike some people on this planet, we have the choice. And because we have such a huge effect, because we do have such a huge effect, because each of our footprints is so large, the choices that we make do make a very big difference. Two years ago, I was lucky enough to spend a few months in India. And in, in Calcutta, I spent uh, a, a while with some family friends, with Ashish and Kajol. And they've lived in the same, their same house on the same street for over 50 years. They've seen so much happen in their country. They've seen the birth of their nation. They've, they've seen partition. They've seen so much life and death on their own street. They're both very educated. Kajul is a high school teacher. Ashish is a professor of genetics at the, the University of Calcutta. And it was wonderful but very intense staying with Ashish. He, of, of course, is you know, such a different person than me who's, you know, this little optimist tourist traveling from, uh, from Vancouver, Canada. He has struggled all his life for his beliefs and for what he believes justice is. But he sees the powerlessness of an individual living in India. And definitely in Calcutta, in a city of 14 million, you can definitely feel the struggle for survival. And he's entirely pessimistic. And I realize that the major reason for our difference in outlook is simply that the, the opportunity for an individual growing up in Canada or Vancouver compared 
to the opportunity for the average person growing up in Calcutta is absolutely a world away. In the context of the global population, we here in this room are so powerful. We are literate. We are educated. We speak English in a, a world where English is, is uh, the most widely used. We know how to use a phone, let alone a computer or a library. We live in a democratic country with the freedom of speech. We live in a democracy where we could actually communicate with our elected leaders. We live in a tolerant society. We live in a country where women have equal rights. We've been born into a part of humanity that doesn't face major challenges to our daily survival. And I think that we are probably the most powerful, the most free, the most informed generation of people who have ever lived. We are living in an unprecedented time of globalization. We have access to the other side of the world in an instant. We have access to all different ideas and minds, resources, information, travel. I mean, we can move around this planet more easily than any other generation before. Just in this room, who here has traveled outside the country? Okay, outside the continent. That's pretty amazing. You know, even 15 years ago, I, that half of the people would have, would have raised your hands. This is a pretty amazing time to be alive. And all over the world, people are recognizing this opportunity. And they are recognizing that they have to take advantage and use it and affect positive change. And I think of so many people. I think of, I think of people that I did meet in India. I think of Dr. Mishra, who is both a holy man in Varanasi, and he's also a professor of hydrology at the University of Benares. And he's leading a crusade to clean up the very holy, very, very polluted river, Ganga. I think of my best friend, Sue, who I grew up with, who shares um, very, very liberal values and who just went out and recently got her MBA and is now teaching economics uh, in Castlegar at a college. I think of Romeo Dallaire, who, of course, you know, came to speak to you last year and what he's doing and raising awareness and keeping awareness up. Think of Michael Clare. Think of Adam Wolf, Jared Diamond. Think of Senator William Bora. It is individuals' involvement in their communities, stepping up, taking responsibility. This is what actually pushes our civilization forward. So, how do we do this? One thing I think is, this is kind of an abstract idea, I guess, but one key, I believe, is a return to the subjective, to the local. I really think that we have to start doing things that really root us to where we live. And I believe that this will inherently increase diversity in the world if we root and we look around ourselves and look at what is important locally. And this is very important because in the last few decades, we have been going through a dramatic reduction in diversity. And I mean, in, any biologist will tell you, in, in any population um, biologist will tell you that you know, reduction of diversity means you're not gonna survive. And it's not just in ecology or biology. We've seen a reduction of diversity of, yes, ecosystems, but also of cultures, of languages, of foods, of businesses, of systems of economics. Just as diversity is the, or is the order for ecological security, so is diversity the way forward in finding ways to shift the outcome of our current story. And I think that if we root ourselves right here, if we look around ourselves and we address the problems, the issues, the solutions right here, we will find sustainable answers. And it's happening already. 
It's happening all over the world. It's happening in schools. It's happening in gardens and households, in communities, in businesses around the planet. Solutions are many. They are diverse. And they are very, very local. Now, I could give you a laundry list of things to do, of ways to reduce your ecological footprint. There's any numbers of websites out there, and actually that's an excellent starting point, is go online and calculate your ecological footprint and figure out you know, what it is that makes your impact large on the earth and start trying to reduce that. But a social worker in the Yukon last year told me, you can change someone's mind, but they can change it again. Change someone's heart. And that can be forever. And so I have a list of five things that I hope might engage your heart a little more after the end of this symposium. So here's Sev's, Sev's five. The first is get outside. Go outside. Go for a walk. Go camping. In Canada, we, we still consider ourselves a nation of outdoors people, but... Over 80% of us now live in cities. We are not going outside in the more, anymore. We're spending a lot of time in front of the computer, a lot of time in front of TV. And we're not familiar with nature anymore. We're not oh, as aware of why it's so important. And, you know, if, if you don't, how, how are you going to care about something and know, know to protect it if you don't understand why it's important? So kill your TV. Get outside. Two, start asking questions about your food. Food is where our environment becomes part of us. This is where we absolutely are our environment. If you are still wondering how you personally are connected to environmental and social issues around the planet, start asking questions about food. Where was it grown? How did it get to my plate? Who grew it? What chemicals are in it? And I'll give you a tip. Start with chocolate. And this, it starts with these kinds of questions, these kind of, you know, just actually thinking about the things that we, that we eat. Because everything that we eat was once alive and got to your mouth somehow, or your plate. And this education will bring us to the next point, which is making educated decisions about what you buy and therefore what you support. You vote with your dollar because the money that you pay for the, your serv the goods that you receive, that goes directly to, to supporting all the little elements of the system, of the political, the economic structures that provide you with that good. Each time we go out to eat, each time we choose a product, every time we make an economic transaction, we are making a statement. We're supporting something. And we should be aware of that statement. Because it means that every day we have an opportunity to actually say something. Three. Ooh, I'm getting really a little bit excited. Three. You might not be an altruist, and I definitely don't consider myself one. But I think that most people don't want to do harm. And one of the most important things that we can do is to examine our daily habits, our, our daily interactions, and think about trying to minimize the harm that we are implicitly involved in because we live in this society. And this is something I'm really frustrated with. You know, I'm not necessarily making a conscious choice, but I am inherently implicated in causing some destruction most of the time. And here I am going to give you a list. This is a, a shameless plug for the recognition of responsibility that uh, was mentioned earlier to do with the Skyfish Project. Um, it's our one, one statement, pledge of intent, and it has a list of ways in which I pledge to reduce my, my impact on the, on the planet. So you can check it out. It's at skyfishproject.org, the recognition of responsibility. Four, I am fascinated by how in our society it has become really different to do the right thing. I mean, it's really hard. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated because this change has happened, I'd say, very recently. And I'll give you one example, and that's disposable coffee cups. 
And I come from Vancouver. It's definitely coffee culture. And I don't think 10 years ago, people used to use disposable cups like they do now. I mean, now you go into any Starbucks and you see that nobody is using non-disposable cups, but they're still sitting in the Starbucks uh, coffee shop. And so they, they, use this, they use their cups for about 10, 15 minutes. And outside, right outside the, the store, the trash can is just piled high with all these coffee cups. Now that's, you know, coffee cups come from somewhere. That's trees that have been used for, you know, 15 minutes and then just thrown away. And I really think that it's a symbol of how we are really trained we are trained to waste. And it's really hard not to use a disposable cup. I mean, it, unless you say it right away, like, no, I have my own cup, or can I please have a non-disposable cup? They'll just give you two. <laughs> Anyways, um, do an experiment. Pick one thing and observe it like an experiment. A coffee cup, um, pl plastic water bottles, buying water, um, plastic bags at the store when you go to get your groceries. And there's any number, number of exercises or experiments that you can conduct. I mean, one, you could just count how many you go through in a week. You could find out where that garbage goes. You could go yourself to the landfill and see, you know, if you can actually see any Starbucks cups. You can ask the store, how many plastic bags do you go through in a week? And is it difficult to find out? I've been asking and nobody really seems to know. How difficult is it for you to remember to bring your, ba your bag, your cup, your water bottle? Um, and how long does it take to break a habit? And I think that a lot of the problems, or not the problems, a, a big part of this, the challenge in terms of alleviating your personal impact on the planet is just breaking habits. And habits are definitely the hardest thing to break. It's not the huge, big things. It's all of the little things that are very hard not to do because we program, programmed ourselves. And this suggestion really ties into the next, my last. And my last suggestion is go see for yourself. To everyone in the crowd looking around you, reading, hearing about what isn't working, the conflict in our world, the contradictions in the way we live. Don't take it from the news. Don't take it from the internet. Don't take it from me. Go and check it out for yourselves. Go out and have an experience. Go to the city limits. Find where that landfill is. Go see where your garbage goes. How do you feel about that? What you see? Go check out a hospital in a major city on a smog alert day. Check out an industrial farm. Go find out where your water goes, where the toilet flushes. Go and travel, see what it's like for the average person living in the developing world. Go see what it's like in the north. Go and see for yourselves. Don't take it from anybody else because once you know, once you have seen it for yourself, you become incredibly powerful. Once you connect information to context, to emotion, no one can take that away from you. And you become accountable. You become an authority. And I, I think, to my own experience, I mean, when I was nine years old and I just, you know, I'd had this great experience and all of a sudden I saw the forest was on fire and suddenly I, I was implicated and I was absolutely sure. It's absolutely overwhelming how much information there is out there. The internet is an incredibly powerful tool, but the information is overwhelming, and we are completely, I am completely, disconnected from that information. It doesn't mean anything anymore. And I think that, you know, this is a new thing, this whole huge influx of information. A real challenge for our generation is going to be to reconnect information to meaning to actually remember what that information, that data that we learn about every day actually impl implies. We can do this by going out and experiencing something so that one, you have the authority then to tell it like it is because you've seen it, and two, so that, not, so that your heart is invested in the reality of what's happening so that you are educated not only with your mind but with your heart. 
With our explosion of science, we've gone to the moon, we've dissected our DNA, we've developed technology to communicate through the ether instantly to the other side of the world. We've also polluted the air, we've polluted the water, we've changed the face of our ecosystems and our societies. We've, a, we've run an experiment of objective science, and now it's clear that it needs some direction. And the partner of our science, the partner of our technology, the partner of our progress has to be human values, human compassion, and human responsibility. Sometimes I think that the problems are just too big. <laughs> They're just too overwhelming. But then I think of the generations of women before me who marched and lobbied and organized so that I might, and all the other women here, might have the opportunities that we do today, our equal rights. I think of all the leaders, all the activists who marched and fought and worked so that I live in a tolerant society where my English mother and my Japanese Canadian father could fall in love and have a family. I think of all of the mothers and fathers and all of the, the people who marched year after year against nuclear war, voicing their opinion. I think of all of the people who have paved the way for us to be sitting here tonight. And when I think of them, I again realize that each of us has the power to influence and inspire. Each of us influence and teach not only our, our children, the children in our lives, but we influence each other. We influence our friends, our family, our, colleague, our colleagues, the people we bump into at the store, people who see us carrying our... our our uh, carry mug. And we will, for good or for bad, ultimately influence the future. And this is a power that every single individual holds. This is a time for spreading ideas. It's a time to talk with your family, your friends, your teachers, your students about what is really important. This is a time to decide what it is that you believe in and to take a stand for those beliefs. It's time to decide what responsibility you have for the world around us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Severn. And now we've got about 30 minutes. We'll take some um, questions, if you have any. So if you want to line up on either side at the microphones, and Severn will try to answer your questions. You mentioned um, not only the role of the individual's responsibility, but you hinted at um, through your talk of being inspired by indigenous people and their cultures, the importance of community and ritual. And um, I think that in, a, in the global capitalist society that's emerging, um, you know, obviously all those values of community and ritual are endangered. Um, and that in a very real way, we're victims of our technology and that we, uh, don't have the time to slow down to enjoy community and ritual. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to not only an individual's responsibility, but also the power of individuals uniting in communities and grassroots organizations to create and affect some change. Well, good, good question. I say I'm not an altruist because I really feel very selfish. I mean, a big reason why, there's many reasons why I feel very strongly about things. I mean, one reason is because I want, you know, I, I want to be able to experience diversity in the world 
in, on so many levels, just for my own life experience and for my children one day, you know, definitely. But then there's also this whole, I mean, being involved and feeling passionately about, about issues and feeling like you're actually moving in a direction with other people and working together and making a contribution. That's an incredibly uh, fulfilling experience. And my life has definitely been far more interesting because I've gotten involved in many different issues. And there's definitely, uh, there's definitely a lot of good that can come out of coming together with other people and joining forces and getting something done. And I think that is an inherent in all of us as, as human beings that we enjoy doing tasks in groups and organizing and working together. And you definitely see it uh, in First Nations communities. I mean, the whole co community comes together and puts on a feast. And it's something that my community in Vancouver could never do because we're totally, you know, I don't even know my neighbors. And, and yet this is something, you know, some of the poorest communities in Canada can do instantly. And, and, and that is a richness that I think that, you know, I, I think that we could definitely benefit from. And I think most people, most people inherently would like that. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question in terms of education. I think um, it might be a bit a naive question here. Um, how do we go with uh, educating people? Um, I mean, you, you have, uh, I think, I'm coming from Europe, and, and we have lots of resources in terms of uh, the day there is no oil anymore, we know we can rely on, let's say, uh, public transportation and so on. Mm -hmm. The day there is no oil here anymore, we can't go anywhere in the US. I mean, it's true. Um, and how do we go with educating people in, in terms of in, in a materialistic society? Um, there's nothing negative here I'm trying to say. I'm, it's in terms of educative projects, and I think I would like to have you, I mean, you already answered some of those questions, but um, as a geographer, it's trying to bridge those different aspects of physical and human. Um, and any ideas or suggestions would be appreciated. Well, thank you for your, for your question. Education is absolutely key. I mean, education is a result of society, but also forms society, so it's, it's a pretty crucial link. I'm, I'm currently um, a teaching assistant in a, in a course that is really interesting just for me to take. It's an introduction to environmental studies. And so it's mostly second and third year students who I don't think have really been exposed to these issues before. And we're learning about the environment, not so much through classic environmental problems. We're learning about the environment through food. And I know I've been talking a lot about food, and I love to eat, so that's a big part of it. But food is a really good connector between people who just don't think about these things and the reality of what our global ecological and social security issues really are. And I've, I've watched these students, you know, everybody is interested in food because, I mean, on so many different levels, just, yeah, for food, for food's sake, but also for health. And, uh, and then you start getting into the social implications. You start talking about the child slave labor in Africa that's working on the cocoa plant plantations that we provide us with our uh, coffee crisps or whatever. And, you know, there is some, there's some, some connection there. So I would just recommend, just as a, as a humble suggestion, to start looking at food politics and food dynamics and how that connects directly to people. Because as a, as in, in terms of a commodified good, it definitely hits close to home. So maybe try, try that. And it's a great excuse to have a potluck in class. <laughs> um, I have a question, a follow-up question about food. Um, I've always been very conscious about what I've eaten, and um, I try to stay away from chemicals and eat, eat more natural foods. Um, but then when I come to college, I have a limited amount of money now. And it's very hard for me to eat the same way that I always have. Um, what do you think that we can do to get more healthy, um, more natural food to people at a reasonable cost? Well, that's always the key, right? I mean, I, I live uh, in Victoria, and it's mostly college students as well. And this is this is the issue: people can't afford to eat organic. Um, but 
I, I think that that's really changing. Um, there's all kinds of things that you can do. You can organize a food co-op and, you know, buy in bulk with a group of other people. And, I mean, that would be a terrific way to start... Um, you know, maybe changing something at the university. There are several examples of campuses that have really lobbied to, to try to get some organic options and start kind of pushing for those kinds of options on campus in different in different places. It's it's a really good starting point in terms of activism. And uh, I, I recently read a, an article. Um, it's a bit. Uh, extreme, on, uh, the tone of it is, is a bit extreme, but it's called uh, The Seven Deadly Myths of Industrial Agriculture by Andrew Kimbrell, and it's part of a, a book in which he really hammers industrial agriculture, and it's a bit almost like almost too much for me, because I think that you always have to see both sides, but, um, but he goes through one of his arguments um, is that when he, he lists the different myths that industrial agriculture promotes to kind of prove why, uh, the, the industrial agriculture proves why, um, you know, it's too expensive or, or it's uh, not efficient enough for us to eat organic or from smaller local farms. And he totally kind of debunks all of these myths. And one of the things is, yeah, um, organic food is too expensive. And then he breaks down all the health costs that you have to deal with when you're actually... Um, you know that, that are hidden when you're when you're eating industrial food, and all of the consequences that happen afterwards, um, health consequences on society, and just the taxes that that the rest of us pay. And when you actually break it down, you see that, you know, organic produce is unbelievably cheap compared to the actual hidden costs there are in our industrialized chemical foods. So, I mean, it's a really interesting article. I'd really encourage you to check out and definitely look into food co-ops um, because a lot of campuses and university students are doing that. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, you spoke a lot about the Northwest tonight and sustainability, and it kind of made me think, um, well, I'm from Alaska and Alaska wild salmon, and I spent last summer promoting Alaska wild salmon, but I was just wondering, I mean, promoting is great, but I was just wondering what you think we can do as students, community members, um, to promote wild salmon in general within the Northwest because it is being depleted and just wanted to pick your brain on that issue. Uh, I'm so glad we're talking so much about food. It's so great. Uh, one of my... One of my names in one of the communities that I visit all the time is the one who never gets full. <laughs> um, well, salmon is, yeah, it's a real crisis that we have on the West Coast, on the Northwest Coast. Um, we, our, our salmon stocks are plummeting in BC. I'm not exactly sure how it is in Alaska, but I think it's maybe not as bad, but it definitely, um, you know, we're, we're just overfishing the entire world's oceans. And so in order to deal with this, or in response, um, we have fish farms. And... Aquaculture, while it is a necessity for the world's current population, um, we have to be really careful about it. And the current mode of aquaculture in BC for salmon is incredibly harmful to the wild stocks. And so this is why there is a campaign, um, well, there's a pro pro farm fish and then there's against farm fish there's big big battle on campaigns about wild versus farmed fish and it's really tricky because yeah we want to promote eating wild salmon instead of farm because we don't want people to eat farmed salmon it's so bad on so many different levels and i mean it comes down to also the fact that it's toxic for human beings they they're so full of chemicals and they're so um full of toxins because they're so fatty and they don't uh, and that really concentrates all of the different ke chemicals um, but the problem is that wild fish stocks are also in decline. So while we're promoting f wild fish stocks, it's not really, you know, how are we actually helping? I mean, the good thing, if we, if we only buy wild salmon, the good thing is that then prices will go up so that then um, fishermen can actually make a living um, and they don't have to catch as many salmon. But I think that one of the things that I think is just the reality is that we're just going to have to scale back our consumption of of protein of meat and um, and and currently like in BC or in the cities people are used to eating salmon on a really regular basis because it's just so readily available and with the farm fish we can have it at any at any time at any at any season and it's just 
always expecting these things um, that is really getting us into this catch-22. So, yeah, we have to promote wild salmon over farmed salmon, definitely, but uh, I think we're just going to have to scale back our consumption of meat. Yes? Yeah, um, I'm a high school teacher here in Moscow. I'm here with a number of my students who are in the environmental club. They were too chicken to get up and ask a question, so I'll ask a question for you. First, I wanted to thank you so much for being such a great inspiration to young people. Uh, my question is this. The students in the environmental club are very active locally. They also take a trip every year to a sea turtle conservation station in Mexico where they work with the biologists to, to uh, collect eggs and um, work towards sea turtle conservation. My question is, how do you balance this action that they're doing and this education they're getting with all the resources we're consuming to get on that airplane and fly there and all the runways we're building as we get educated through international travel? Great question. I definitely flew here. <laughs> um, there, you know, I mean, there's a lot of impacts to everything that we do. And I think the first step is awareness. So, you know, taking into consideration that our actions actually have implications, I think that's pretty huge, that alone. And then you can make your decision knowing that, okay, well, there is this consequence and, you know, I, this is worth it to me to know that I, you know, pro pollute X amount of, of a tons of carbon dioxide or methane or whatever. But there are some things that you can do to mitigate um, uh, air travel, and that is carbon offset programs, and that's uh, what uh, the uh, Bora Symposium will be getting is a, a bill in the mail from me, which will pay for my carbon offset for my trip from Victoria to um, to uh, Pullman. And, uh, and what it is is it, there's several of these companies I think there's even the carbon neutral company. That's the name of it, I think. Um, but you can just search them online. And it will calculate the amount of um, pollution that you, your, trip, um, your trip produces. And then it will calculate um, an offset program for you, so some way to mitigate. So you make a, a, a donation of, it's, it's actually not that much. I mean, from a trip across from Victoria to Toronto, um, it's kind of like a tax. It actually only is about $20, and that $20 will go towards some alternative energy or planting a certain amount of trees. And you can decide, you know, how you actually want to make an offset. I mean, um, for me, carbon sequestration, which is the idea of having trees absorb carbon dioxide, Personally, I don't really think that's that viable of a, that's not really a solution just because of the fact that trees also breathe out and anyways. But something that I, I would like to contribute to is, um, you know, investment in renewable energies. And so there's lots of programs that you can do like that that, you know, if anything will just make you realize that there is a cost to what we do. Yeah. This is just a general question. Um, you gave us five ways to sort of reconnect the environment um, and sort of raise consciousness about the impact that each of us plays um, on our day-to-day -day basis on the environment. And um, I was just wondering what you see as this current, like this generation, what, where they're moving in terms of this. Are they being reconnected or not? Um, in my personal experience, when I'm just talking to people my age, like, general questions of what you study, say environmental policy, they're like, oh, I'm glad somebody cares. I don't really see like um, a generation willing to care about the environment. Do you see um, in your travel, more extensive travel, probably more extensive travels than mine, a greater understanding or are we just being more, more disconnected? Great question. Well, my answer on this fluctuates daily, <laughs> and it depends on, I guess, my interactions with people. But I really think that, I don't know, it's really a combination. And I, right now, I'd like to, I, I think I'm on the, the optimist side. And um, I'm currently doing this project uh, with several other Canadians of our age group, so like mid-20s. Um, and, and, and I'm researching young Canadians who are actually doing something. Um, in their communities, from simply volunteering, 
um, to starting up their own organization, social justice organization, or biking across Canada to raise awareness about environmental issues. And it's incredibly hopeful. I mean, these people really understand sustainability in a way that I think people of other generations don't really understand. And, 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 and I think it's because sustainability as a concept, you know, we grew up with the idea. It was coined in 1987 by the Brentland Commission. So, you know, we were just kids and since then everybody's been talking about sustainable development. And to me, what it really is, is simply, you know, the reintegration of all these different elements that so obviously are connected. I mean, cause and effect, come on, it's so obvious. And sustainability really is the only option that we have. We're running out of resources. We don't really have a choice. And so kind of because of that, because we don't really have a choice, I think that people will have to come around. And they already, people who are um, ambitious and, you know, keeping their eyes open for what kind of career and where they want to be and, and making things happen, a lot of them are very much um, involved in some aspect of sustainability issues. So I think on that, on that side of things, there's a lot of young people who are really, you know, they're really starting to push this new wave of just basically an inevitable, an inevitable idea. But at the same time, I also, I do know that there is an incredible lot of apathy and a lot of opinions on why that is as well. And one of the problems is that it's very, very comfortable living in Canada and the U.S. right now. And we don't have to care about anything. And uh, I, think, I think it will shift when it has, we have to shift when something happens. And I'm, I'm, it's quite interesting to see um, the response to Hurricane Katrina because, you know, this is a, something that you could attribute to, to climate change. I mean, we can't for sure, but this is exactly what is predicted would happen, these crazy and erratic weather patterns, more extreme. Um, that happened to the United States. And when I was at, um, at the Kyoto conference in December, I met so many um, municipal politicians from the eastern states. And they were, they were sounding like totally radical environmentalists. They were Republicans, they were Democrats, didn't matter, because they are directly feeling the consequences of climate change. And I bet you that young people there care. So I think it will naturally change is changing. Okay, we have time for two more questions and then we're gonna call it a night, so. Okay, you've been waiting. Um, I'm just curious, what are some of the things that you do on a daily basis that helps to promote uh, personal behavioral change? Good question. Um, the coffee cup, it's really important. It's so little and it's so big. Um, I, yeah, just always carry my own mug and just in, in using it, people ask me, what am I doing? I have to educate people. And it's just a good practice. Um, another thing is water. I don't buy any bottled water because I, I don't believe in it. <laughs> I, uh, you know, if we accept that water is a commodity and that we have to pay for it, we're basically giving up on most people on this planet that will never be able to afford to buy water you know, water is a basic human right. It should be available to everybody on this planet. And once we accept that you have to buy water, I mean, water is more expensive than oil. I think that we're really, we're really compromising our standards for the entire planet. And so everywhere I go, you know, I always bring my own water bottle or bring my own cup and drink water. Because there's still lots, of, I mean, we have great water here in North America. And it blows my mind that people buy it. Um, Oh, and, and when I was in India, when I was traveling around India, I had these little water uh, chlorine drops. Didn't taste like anything. And I just, everywhere I went, I just would get water and then just purify it myself. And, you know, all the tourists around me, they were all drinking, buying water bottles, they were spending a lot of money and throwing out incredible, I mean, you just see these mounds of plastic waste. And while I was there, there was a scandal that there was a water bottling company that wasn't even purifying their water at all. They were just bottling it up and just like shipping it out. And all these tourists got sick and I didn't. So, ha. Ah. <laughs> yes? I wanted to know, um, do you go to elementary schools 
and, and speak to children because I think what's just as powerful as stopping bad environmental habits is instilling good ones. I mean, my daughter's four and a half and she watched your, at, when you were a child speaking and she understood at four and a half what you were saying. And so I, I think it's important. So do you do that? Yes, I think it's totally important too. I mean, kids are the most astute at these issues because it's so simple. I mean, these things are really, really simple. And my message is really, really simple. And I, I think that as we get older and we get more entrenched in, well, the reality of how we have to survive in the world, um, we do get more confused about what the really important things are. And so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we could start, I mean, we have to start with our kids because they're the ones who know, who know best. So thank you so much for your wonderful questions and your attention.